Hi, my name is Jessica Sindel. I'm an associate attorney with Anderson and Bovac, and I'm here today to talk about guardianships of minor children. So first, it's important to understand when a guardianship may be necessary or it may be what's best for that child. A guardian is generally named either by a judge or by the parents when the parent is unable to care for that child on a long-term basis. Now, that could be because the parent has died. It could be because the parent is ill or otherwise incapacitated or has some long-term condition that makes it impossible for them to care for their child day to day. It could be that the parent is suffering from substance abuse or that the parent has left the child in the care of somebody else and they've not returned and their whereabouts are unknown. In those situations, it would be appropriate for another adult to seek guardianship of that child in order for them to have the legal decision-making authority necessary to make medical decisions and educational decisions that are in the well-being of that child. Generally, guardians are family members or friends of the child that already have an established relationship. And in some circumstances, the guardian may have already been acting as a caregiver for the child informally and is seeking to formalize that situation either through court approval or in writing. It's important that any guardian for any child meets the following requirements. They must be 18 years old, be a resident of the U.S., be of sound mind, not be legally disabled, and not have a felony conviction that involves harm or threat to a child. There are three types of guardianships to be considered, plenary or long-term guardians, standby guardians, and short-term guardians. A plenary guardian is someone who's going to assume that role for the long term and for the foreseeable future, and it only occurs under certain circumstances and with a judge's approval. A long-term guardian will be appointed if the parents are deceased, if the parents are unable or unwilling to make daily decisions for their children, if the parents have voluntarily left the child in the care of another adult and have not returned, if the parents have agreed to guardianship, or if the parents have been arrested, detained, removed, or deported because of immigration issues. Once a guardian has been approved, they maintain that role until the child turns 18, unless the guardianship is dissolved. That only happens under limited circumstances, either if a parent petitions to dissolve the guardianship and resume care of their child, or if the guardian seeks to have another guardian appointed to care for the child in their absence. It's also important to know that once the child turns 18, the child and the guardian no longer have a formal or legal relationship. The guardianship will dissolve as the child is no longer a minor. The individual petitioning for guardianship of the child must provide information about the parent's whereabouts to the court. They also must provide the parents notice of the place and time of the guardianship hearing so that the parent can appear and object if they wish to. And in the event that the court decides that there is an able and willing parent for the child, court should not grant the guardianship, but rather should return care and control of the child to the parent who has expressed that they wish to resume that caretaking role. A standby guardian is also a guardian who would take care of the children for the foreseeable future, but has actually been personally selected by the parents as their preferred caretaker. So this could potentially be somebody who's named in a will or other legal document in the event of the parent's death or their incapacity. A standby guardian does not require a judge's approval, but they do require that the document be witnessed by two different individuals. A standby guardian can only be appointed when the parent or legal guardian dies, the parent or legal guardian consents, the parent or legal guardian can no longer make day-to-day -day decisions for the child, or the parent or legal guardian has been detained, arrested, removed, or deported because of immigration issues. Finally, there's also the short-term guardian. This is somebody who's appointed to take care of the children on a very short-term basis by agreement with the parents. So for instance, a short-term guardian could be named during a military deployment, a long-term job training, or in the event that work or some other obligation takes the parent out of the state or out of the country for a prolonged period of time. And it could be that the parent needs another adult to step in to take care of the day-to-day -day decisions and the general caretaking needed for a child. A short-term guardianship should also be in writing and witnessed by two individuals. It should also include an expiration date and shouldn't go past a year. The understanding is that a short-term guardianship will not be long-term, it will be finite, and that it ends when the parent is willing or able to resume care for the children, even if that date comes before the expiration date. There are many different kinds of issues and disputes that can arise during a guardianship or after one has been established. 
that are important to look at and to know if you're planning on pursuing guardianship. The most common issue that comes up in a guardianship is when a parent wants to resume that caretaking responsibility. I think it's important to note that even though a guardianship can be dissolved, it doesn't mean that they automatically will be dissolved just because the parent has petitioned and asked the court to dissolve it. Instead, the court is going to look at what are the circumstances of the child? How long have they been with the guardian? What's their living situation? What's their schooling? What relationship do they have with other children or individuals in the home? They're going to take all of that into consideration when deciding what's in the best interest of the child. They're also going to take a look at what the parent situation is. And so they're going to look at whether the parent is stable, whether they're working, and what changes they've made in order to be willing and able to care for the child now in a way that they weren't in the past. It's also important to know in these situations that the court may appoint an attorney to represent the child's best interest, called a guardian ad litem, who will conduct an investigation into the family, looking into the guardian and the parents, talking to the child, finding out the different circumstances of their life in order to make a recommendation about whether it would be appropriate for guardianship to be dissolved and whether the parents should be allowed to resume caretaking. In one case that I had a few years ago, a long-term guardian who had had the child since age six months, and I believe he was 13 at the time the case went back to court, was fighting to keep guardianship of the child after the mother had petitioned to have it dissolved. In that case, the court really relied heavily on the guardian ad litem and their investigation, which really found that this child had a very strong bond to the guardian and the other children in the home that he'd been living with this person and this person had been his primary caretaker for almost his entire life. And that because this family actually lived out of state, moving the child back to Chicago and Illinois would be highly disruptive for that child. And in that event, the court found that it was really in the child's best interest to remain with the guardian instead of returning to his mother. Another important issue to consider is how the courts will handle a situation where multiple people have petitioned for guardianship of a child. When that happens, the judge is going to look at all the petitions and all the individuals who are asking to be named guardian and will make a determination as to who would be most appropriate for that responsibility. Often in that situation, the judge will appoint a guardian ad litem to conduct an investigation, talk to the child, talk to the different petitioning guardians, and find out what seems to be the most appropriate placement for that child and who would be the most appropriate caregiver. In one case that I handled recently, a child needed a guardian because both of his parents were deceased and both of his grandparents ended up petitioning for guardianship of the child in order to make sure that he had a legal caregiver. Ultimately, in that case, the court decided to split the role and have one set of grandparents be the guardianship of the child's person or his body, and the other grandparents were named the guardians of his estate regarding the inheritance he had from his parents' life insurance policies and other accounts. I think another critical issue to think about with guardianship is what are the motives of the person who is petitioning to become guardian of the child? Are they petitioning because a guardianship is really necessary for that child? Or are they petitioning because they want that child and believe that they would be a better caretaker than the parents? It's important to remember the legal ramifications and the importance of parental rights and that those are not things that can be taken lightly or be taken away from parents arbitrarily. The court must really look at whether guardianship is appropriate and whether there really is a parent who is able and willing to care for those children. An individual who's petitioning for guardianship must explain why the parents are unavailable or unwilling to care for the child. They must also provide notice to the parent or parents of the hearing so that they are aware that someone is attempting to get guardianship of the child and they can come to court and fight it if that's what they want to do. In one important guardianship case that I handled for a father, he had given short-term guardianship to the grandmother to care for the children while he did a job training that was going to last several months. It was his understanding with the grandmother that the children would be returned to his care once he was done with the job training. And in fact, when he finished job training, he asked for the children to be returned to him. But instead of returning them, the grandmother insisted on keeping the kids and filed her petition for minor guardianship and ultimately withheld information from the court about dad's whereabouts and his availability and also withheld information from dad about the hearing date and place, which prevented him from being able to appear that day and to fight against the guardianship. What ended up happening was that when I took on my client's case, I filed a motion to vacate 
asking the judge to throw out the guardianship because it was unnecessary and had been obtained improperly. After a long hearing, the judge agreed with me that the grandmother had in fact withheld information both from the father and from the court that was critical and that the guardianship was not necessary because the father was ready and willing to resume caretaking responsibility for his daughters. The guardianship was voided, and the next day, the children were returned to my client, which we saw as a major victory. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video. If you have any questions, feel free to contact my firm or check out my blog on this issue on our website, www.illinoislaw4u.com.